All right, I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, the first of our Gospels, Matthew 24, describing when the world is at its worst. My teaching has been on the end times throughout this chapter, and I was thinking we would go through it quickly, and whenever I do that, I go slower, and it's not intended to go slow, but slowly, but I think it's important for us to understand the times we're in in light of what is coming and how things are moving from bad to worse in society. Who knows what is all happening on a different scale in different countries, but at least through what we can perceive in our culture, things like a parent-baby dedication that we're going to hold in at the end of the hour where parents will stand up and they'll have their baby in their arms and it's the representation of God's institution of the family, a man married to a woman where they have a child or children. Uh, we've dedicated, I'm sure, a single parent before and again with equal nobility there, raising kids in the Lord with clarity of a man and a woman these days as that being a marriage is something that when you say that's really the only real marriage, that's something that's offensive in our culture. Uh, if people throw everything together, every admixture of couples or, or dynamics or what the world calls partners, these are all, this is all contrary to what the Bible gives to us as a clear vision of um, biblical reality, what a real wedding and a real marriage is, is testified to us from Scripture. And in this world, we are called to persevere as witnesses, where we hold on to biblical truth and we, we shine forth biblical truth by what we believe in, by what we attend, by what we stand for, and what we say and where we go and what we do, all is a witness to winning the world. And so Jesus, as he is in Matthew 24, is at the final stage of his three-year ministry on earth, and he's at the Mount of Olives sitting with his disciples. And the last sermon that he's giving is this Olivet Discourse, this final discourse, this final sermon, and what he's talking about is the answer to their question, what is the sign of your coming? When will the end be? And he begins to speak of the markers of wars and rumors of wars and uh, people standing up, as verse 5 says, saying, I'm the Christ and leading many astray. These are the signs of the times and the signs of the end of the age. Matthew 24, 23, look, here is the Christ or there he is. These are false teachers and false witnesses where people are trying to lead people astray to believe in false doctrine, false ways to heaven, which ultimately um, is the call for people to join whole communities. Come out into the wilderness community, verse 28, or go to the inner rooms. And Jesus is saying, don't believe it. But these are the signs of the end times that Jesus is talking about. But no sign is greater than the one that we will see in verses 29 through 31, which is the sign of his coming. Now, all of this teaching is cast in a timeline that I've been teaching about regarding the rapture, how the church will be raptured as the next event in the end times calendar, if you will. The Lord comes with the trumpet sound, with a shout and a cry from heaven, and the dead in Christ rise first, meaning those who have died already and are with the Lord will come back with him in the clouds raised, and those who are here on earth will be caught away, the word rapture, raptured away up to meet those who've gone before in heaven and to go with the Lord um, away from the earth, and those who are left here will be destined to endure a seven-year tribulation period. This is Jacob's trouble that was predicted in the Old Testament. At three and a half years, the mid part of the tribulation is what verse 15 speaks of. We learned of the abomination of the desolation where the Antichrist will come and literally desecrate the temple in Jerusalem. 
and he will lead many astray. And the call in verse 16 is for those who are believers to flee, to run, to flee to the mountains. All of this is predicted in Daniel, but is repeated in the teachings of Christ, that that's what those believers should do. And those believers, as Revelation 14 describes, are the 144,000 Jews. You have 12 tribes represented, one, um, well, 12,000 times 12 who are represented in the 144,000, each 12,000 representing a tribe of Israel to show the continuity of God's plan for Israel even in the future. That remnant of Jews, ethnic Jews, will be the ones who are testifying of Christ when the world is at its worst. And what they're doing is they are persevering as a testimony, just as we are persevering and we are following their future, future model that Jesus teaches us, us about what they will do then, we are to do here now. So we're following their example. And their example of perseverance is enduring, is not capitulating, no matter how hard the pressure gets in culture and life against the Lord so in terms of our points that I've been preaching, verses 15 to 22 is run from evil, flee these things, flee evil. What is evil? Well, this is discerning false messiahs. You're discerning false gospels, false miracles, false communities, and a false promise. Hey, this is the way to heaven. And then you see in verse 28 that that's where the corpse is. That's where the vultures will gather. If you follow an antichrist, you'll ultimately be doomed in destruction at the end of the tribulation. The coming of Christ is portrayed in the New Testament as a rapture coming where the Lord meets us in the air and takes the church away. And then you have the tribulation saints that are born again during the tribulation, both the 144,000 Jews, other Jews and Gentiles. And then the next event is at the end of the seven year tribulation where you have the Lord's return that's described here in verses 29, 30 and 31, what is known classically in scripture as the day of the Lord. This is a terrible day, but I want to be clear that, and you can put the points on the board, run from evil. The second point is to, is to discern false messiahs. The third point that we're going to be looking at is to recognize and embrace the true messiah. And the true messiah is described in verses 29 30. 30 and 31. And why is this important? What you have here in chapter 29 is the warning against racing after false messiahs, false gospels, false teaching, all the stuff I talked about last week. But instead of going for them, you need to find out who the true messiah is. And this true description of Jesus comes in his return to the day of the Lord. You say, well, isn't Jesus the Lamb of God? Isn't he the one who is described as love and gracious and empathetic and kind and the shepherd? Yes, he's all of those things. In his first coming, he came as this lamb, even confusing the Jews looking for a Messiah who would come as a lion who was going to ultimately conduct a political takeover. But instead, Jesus is coming and he's coming as the the, the one who's a shepherd gathering his sheep, wanting people to turn and look to the Messiah as Savior, who is described to love as love, who is full of grace. But at the same time, Jesus being God is not only loving and gracious, he's also the God of wrath, justice, and judgment. The same Jesus who ministered to the publicans and the sinners and said, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon your back. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Let me break you away from the vice grip of the Pharisees and legalism. That same Jesus is the same one who, as the loving shepherd, also went in at the beginning of his three-year ministry and swept out the temple with super empowered strength on him like Samson, clearing the temple, moving thousands of people out, upending tables and pronouncing basically a clear judgment on the misuse and abuses in the temple. 
And then he did it again on Monday, just upending things. He indicted the Pharisees saying, the end is now for you. I'm condemning you for committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So Pharisees, you have reached the point of no return. This is the judgment of God in Christ because Jesus is God. God is Jesus. All of who God is, is found in the person of Christ, fully God and fully man. And so you have to believe that Jesus' return is both triumphant and terrible at the same time. It's an act of unimaginable grace where he's gathering his elect And at the same time, he's exercising and executing severe justice that is final justice on those who've rejected him, who've rejected his love, who've rejected his grace, who have counteracted his holiness. This is what it means to think about the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord. I've watched people and on, you know, modern sort of sound bites, you see people talk about God and the afterlife and heaven in more sort of philosophical categories, esoteric categories. They really wonder about what it's going to be like and is it going to be real or not. But instead of living hopelessly, people will say, well, I want to live in hope of Jesus' return and I want to live in hope of heaven because that's my best guess. It's my best thing that I could live for and hope for. I heard this one person say, I may as well believe in God and the gospel because if it's not true, then what do I have to lose? Which reflects the old Blaise Pascal, the 16th, um, 1600s philosopher, French philosopher, who created something popularly known as Pascal's wager. And he said this, belief is a wise wager, like a bet. Faith cannot be proved, so what harm will come to you if you gamble on its truth and and it proves false? If you gain, you gain all. In other words, if heaven is real, hey, you know, woo, you get it. You know, you're there. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then without hesitation that he exists. In other words, just make it all a big gamble or bet. That's making faith a game, and it's ultimately ignoring the conscience that God put in every person on earth. Everybody made in the image of God has what Ecclesiastes calls eternity in their heart. They're wondering about the afterlife life. Many people will kind of try to create the kill switch on that by, you know, just ignoring it or suppressing the truth in their sin or unrighteousness, but a person is ultimately confronted in their conscience with life and death in eternity. And so people will play philosophical games instead of looking at what the Bible says. The Bible says that heaven is real and God as the creator is someone whom we will be accountable to give an answer to. I think the number one reason that people are ignoring The end, and a lot of people really don't think about Jesus returning here on earth, is because they don't want anything to do with a God that they're accountable to. That's why people are playing games. That's why people make it a philosophical thing. That's why people say, you know, I'll hope in heaven. I'll believe in Jesus because if it's not real, I had a better life believing in Jesus than I would have otherwise. That's not saving faith. And that's not doing business with God who is holding your heart and your life accountable. To want Jesus to return is to want him to open you up. And he's going to do that. Now, if we're covered by the blood of Christ, he welcomes us as his children. There's still accountability at some level, but there's not condemnation. But for unbelievers, there is full condemnation, full judgment, full final judgment that's on them. Think in terms of the rapture moment. At the rapture, there's a measure of finality because the church goes to heaven and is resurrected. Those here left here on earth are going under judgment and tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, when the day of the Lord comes and Jesus returns here to earth, there's going to be that winnowing fork where people are sent out into judgment like Psalm 1 pictures or people are swept into the millennial kingdom. That's a picture of finality. 
Ultimate finality happens at the end of the thousand years with the new heavens and the new earth, and that's the great white throne judgment. These are stages of finality in the end times where things are very clearly binary. You have sheep going to heaven and you have wolves that are going to, or goats that are going to hell. There's both rescue and judgment with this. Let me read our text with this as a, kind of a prelude to explanation. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So again, the three points leading up through verse 31 is, are these, run from evil, discern false teachers, and then embrace the true Messiah. See him for who he is. And the way Jesus is describing himself in terms of his second coming is in a cataclysmic setting, an end of the world setting. How do you know who the true Messiah really is? He'll be marked by this kind of return. What kind of return? Well, one that's marked by unimaginable fallout. That's the first subpoint under point three. Unimaginable fallout. That's verse 29. Notice again, verse five is where people are saying, I am the Christ. They're leading people astray. Verse 23, look, here is the Christ. There he is. Don't believe it. That's not, these are not the true Christ. These lesser Jesus is these false Jesus is that are saying this is the way to heaven or that they're not the ones to follow. They're all a lie. We need to look for the Jesus of verses 29, 30 and 31. Note the word immediately It says immediately after the tribulation, there's an immediacy with Christ's return. That word I think it's in the original language, euthus. It's the idea of an, an, an instantaneous shift. There's a shift that's going on. We're, we're going one way. Where everything's operating scientifically according to the laws of science. Um, therm thermodynamics are happening. The second law of thermodynamics are happening. Things are kind of melting down in atrophy. Um, stars are still navigating systems where people can scientifically predict things that are happening, where the constellations are going to be, how things are operating in the universe, the magnetic fields are working. Everything is operating in full function in our universe, and then immediately something is going to shift at the end of the days of the tribulation. It says the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give it's light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now we in the church age are looking for toward the rapture. First Corinthians 15, 51 it says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And then it says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there's going to be a shift that'll happen for us as we anticipate the Lord's return. We're anticipating a big shift but it is a shift where we are changed and we meet the Lord in the air. It's the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And we shall all be changed, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The trumpet blast is described. There's a cry of command. The Lord descends from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first, meaning those who've already preceded us who are in heaven will be resurrected first. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 4 describes this event, the rapture of the church event at the beginning of the tribulation, again, as something that you, you anticipate, but you can't prepare for the moment. 
It says, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Suddenly, in a way that we're anticipating but we can't predict. In the Old Testament, you have visions of what are Connecting to verses 29 to 31, these are visions of the day of the Lord, which the day of the Lord, again, is the return of Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Listen to these references, Isaiah 13. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. It goes on to talk like Jesus does in apocalyptic language. The stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed light. It goes on from there in verse 13 saying, The heavens tremble the day of the Lord of hosts in that day of its fierce anger. This is a direct um, revelation and condemnation on Babylon that had taken uh, the kingdom of, of, of God on earth into Babylonian captivity, the southern kingdom, but it's speaking forward to the end times and the day of the Lord. Joel 2, 11 says, the Lord utters his voice before his army for his camp is exceedingly great. Who executes his word is powerful for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Obadiah 1, 15 for the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. Zephaniah 1.14 says the great day of the Lord, listen to this, is near, near and hastening fast. So it's coming and it's coming faster and faster. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. Verse 15, a day of wrath, a day of wrath is that day. Verse 16, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities. Verse 18, it says, neither silver nor gold shall be able to deliver them from on that day, so money won't help, of the wrath of the Lord. And then it says, in all earth, the all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. It's just immediate. And it's going to happen cataclysmically and comprehensively to the whole world. You're not safe if you're, an American citizen, you're not safe from any sort of protection internationally around the world. There is no embassy that can keep you from this great God. If you are outside of Christ, you are going to come under wrath at this moment. Revelation 19, 11, then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is John's vision of Jesus' return. All of this, though, is to build in us anticipation. And I want to make the case that as much as the day of the Lord is terrible and terrifying, the tribulation saints, the believers during the tribulation, just like we are today, we're anticipating the Lord's return. It's shocking. It's terrible. Perhaps you've been awakened out of a nightmare before and thought the tribulation was upon you because of some loud noise or whatever. There's something terrible to think about in terms of a, a massive cataclysmic shift. I heard stories about somebody who was trying to buzz in to a Bible study that was upstairs one time and nobody was answering, nobody's there, you know, someone thinking they've been left behind. You have these different stories. I've heard of dorm room, Christian school dorm room, um, you know, events where people blast trumpets and wake people up and terrify them. There's something in the human psyche where you're just thinking, man, you know, what is going to happen? But as that anticipation is real and there's something terrifying and terrible about the Lord's return. We are also saved by grace and we should want the Lord Jesus more than anything. We want a Jesus that is this big and this awesome because as terrifying as he is to those whom he will judge, he's equally loving and gracious to welcome us home to him. And he's worthy of our worship because he is this awesome and he is this wonderful. Remember John at the end of the book of Revelation in verse 20, he's quoting Jesus saying, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. 
John says, come, Lord Jesus. The New American Standard says, Jesus says, I am, I, I am coming quickly and quotes John saying, amen, come, Lord Jesus. Like, I want you to come quickly. What's going to be happening when he comes, though? At the end of the tribulation, creation will be unraveling. He will be unfurled on the clouds, and the creation itself will be unraveling. The sun will have no more use. It'll be darkened because Jesus is now the light. The moon will not give off light because the sun's been extinguished. Stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. All the laws of nature will become immediate chaos, and the navigation systems will all be shut down. You know, planes in the air. I don't know what's going to happen, but things are going to go completely cataclysmic and disruptive. The stellar magnetic fields won't work anymore. Everything will be unpredictable. Spurgeon said there'll be no further need for the sun or moon or stars when he who is brighter than the sun shines forth in glory. It's the glory of his father and of the holy angels. Luke 21 says that people will be fainting in fear. That means they'll be going breathless. People will be falling over dead. The signs of the sun, moon, and stars, Luke 21, 25, um, and the and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. The oceans will be in tumult. Christ is returning. And would we expect anything less than complete cataclysmic destruction if he's coming back in wrath? Right now, he's holding back his wrath. He's withholding his wrath so that everyone here on earth can believe. He's calling out to the world in love and grace and mercy and gospel witness through the church for all to come from all the nations of all the earth to believe so that thousands and thousands upon ten thousands will be in heaven with him from all the nations singing unto the lamb as creator and savior. That's what we are a part of as his church. But when he returns on this terrible day, everything that he's Holding back will be unleashed. The dam will break. All of the molecules will begin to sort of disperse from each other. The Lord holds everything together as creator and he's going to let everything self-immolate. John 1, 3, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 13, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. You better believe Jesus is the, the second member of the Trinity in participation with the Father and the Holy Spirit at creation, I believe Jesus is the voice of God who is saying, let there be light in Genesis chapter one. All things were created by Christ and for Christ, for his glory. In him, he's the one that holds it all together, even on an atomic level. Hebrews 1.3, he's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the same nature as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is holding you together, everything together, all the terra firma together. And all of this is going to be allowed to unravel for his glory. Jesus is proclaiming he's the alpha, he's the omega, he's the beginning and the end. Revelation 4.1, worthy are you, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. This is what the saints will sing in heaven. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. In a word, when the heavens are shaken, as verse 29 says, it's going to be cataclysmic. We have a window of that in the narrative when Jesus died on the cross and the Father turned his back on the Son in that dark, dark hour. As the sacrifice for sin um, was all being um, adjudicated in that moment where all of the wrath of God was put against all of the sins of all of the, of the believers of all time, of all the ages, where Jesus is experiencing 10,000 hells on earth on our behalf. In that moment, the world sort of um, went into a pre sort of a prefiguring of the day of the Lord. It says in Matthew 27, 51, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. 
The world shook at Christ being on the cross. So why do people pretend that this isn't going to happen? Why do people want to ignore the idea of an imminent return of Christ? I mean, the older people get a lot of times as believers, people say, I want Jesus to come sooner and sooner and sooner. I want out of here because the Lord is everything. The lackluster of the world sort of wears off and we want Jesus. All we truly have is Christ. But you have to want the Jesus of Scripture, not just a Jesus who is defined one-dimensionally in terms of love. That's what people will say. Jesus is love. He's grace. He's empathy. He's a shepherd. And that's all of Jesus. But two things can be true about something at the same time. And there's a lot true about Jesus. All of what the Bible says about Jesus is true all at the same time. He is the God of grace and he's the God of truth. He's the God of love and he's the God of wrath. He's the God of justice and mercy and he's the God of judgment and even eternal judgment. He's all of these things. C.S. Lewis captured this idea in an allegory called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where he's portraying a dialogue between a little girl named Susan and Mr. Beaver who is sort of the kind of a streetwise animal who can talk, if you can stomach that. But you have C.S. Lewis, and he pictures God as a lion. I think he uses a good metaphor for God, explaining him in terms of majesty, power, but in warm fur and sort of with targeting um, eyes. And as the conversation goes, Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion. The lion, the great lion. Susan says, ooh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. We need to understand that this is the one whom we are held accountable by and this is the one whom we anticipate in his coming. Second, not only do we see that there's an unimaginable fallout in the, the final days embracing the true Messiah is marked by this fallout, but it's also marked by an unmistakable sign. Look at verse 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What does this mean? The sign of the Son of Man is harking back to Jesus where he's teaching the disciples. He's sitting with them on the Mount of Olives. It's sort of outside of Jerusalem. He's there. This is his final sermon before he's going to go to the cross. This is the last thing he's talking about and the disciples like you know seminary students are just eager to find out the answer to the great question they want to know when uh, when will these things be verse 3 when will they be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age can you please explain the end times to us we kind of had this understanding that you were going to come as messiah and overthrow rome because of all these passages that say you're going to do that and sort of plant your kingdom here on earth. And it doesn't seem like that's what you're doing. So when are these things going to happen? And what do we look for? And Jesus begins to give the precursors of wars, rumors of wars and false messiahs and things to avoid. But then he says in verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. So what is the sign? The sign is the Son. The sign is the Son. The sign is Jesus. Sign could be a word that signifies the standard. The standard of the end is the sun. The point of creation unraveling is so that the only thing that you really have in that moment to deal with is the sun, Jesus, and he's coming in the clouds. This is all picking up on what Daniel prophesied and predicted in Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. He comes in the clouds. You see that in verse 30. The son of man 
coming on the clouds? Is he riding the clouds? Is he in the midst of the clouds? Clouds are a picture of God's presence. When you think of Emmanuel as the title for God, God is with us. He's upon us. He's coming in the clouds. He's not distant. He's near. Psalm 104 builds this picture in verse 3. He makes the clouds his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. Revelation 14, 14. Look, behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. This is Jesus. He's coming in the clouds. Verse 30, again, remakes the earlier point. Christ's return marks a rescue for tribulation saints and likewise a judgment. It says all the tribes of the earth in verse 30 will mourn, will mourn. What does that mean? Well, the 144,000, those are the ones who are the tribulation saints who are Jews. They're the believers you could say Zechariah 12.10 is speaking of those believing Jews who are mourning the one whom they are looking upon. I will pour out on the house, Zechariah 12.10, of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. So they're given grace, they're given mercy. What's their response? So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, the Jews will feel the weight of accountability for the sin that caused Jesus the Messiah to go on the cross. They will sort of resonate with the first, uh, the generation that was with Jesus that would put him on the cross. They would feel blame for that. And it says they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. This is the weeping of true repentance you can also translate verse 30, the word tribes, as nations. It could be that this is speaking to unrepentant nations. Then all the nations of the earth will mourn. That word fulai can be nations or tribes. If it's tribes, it's speaking to the Jews. If it's nations, it's speaking broadly to unrepentant people. Both dynamics are happening when Jesus returns. Just like how the word of God, it softens the heart and it hardens the heart at the same time. It's like a two-edged sword that's striking both ways. It's a saving word, and it's also a condemning word. Jesus, who is the word, brings the same effect. Jesus is that dividing line where people are shifting towards him or shifting away from him. Luke summarizes this scene in Luke 21, 28, calling the Jews to raise their heads because their redemption draws near so this is the repentance of the Jews. Lift your head. Believe on the one whom you have pierced. It's a mournful acceptance. So anyway, to bring us to our final point for embracing the true Messiah, there's unimaginable fallout. That's one way to recognize that this is the real Jesus. Secondly, an unmistakable sign. This is actually Jesus as described in Daniel. He's coming on the, in the clouds with power and great glory. And then thirdly, an unchangeable outcome. Unimaginable fallout, unmistakable sign, unchangeable outcome. This is where things are bringing about finality between those who are his and those who are not. Verse 31, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the of heaven to the other. Loud trumpet calls and trumpet blasts are seen throughout the book of Revelation. You hear of that when Jesus comes to rapture his church, there'll be a trumpet blast. Trumpet blasts are to wake people up to sort of be alert. If you've ever heard a high pitch trumpet blast, you, you know it's, it's striking. Well, this will be the ultimate trumpet blast showing this eschatological event is real and happening. And it's sweeping because it's drawing the line of demarcation between those who are his and those who are not. Those who are gathered as the elect, it says. Those who are genuine believers from the four winds. And those who are not, the elect are gathered from all four winds, meaning all four points of the compass. 
Every direction that the wind blows, that's how sweeping the gospel witness will be at the end. You say, I thought the day of the Lord is terrible and it's judgment and it's what we want to avoid. Well, if you're the elect in that moment, you're gathered into the, mill the millennial kingdom. This is how far reaching and how wide the kingdom witness is from every place under the sky because that's, this is, I'm quoting this, that's how far the gospel of the kingdom will have been preached from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. From one end of heaven to the other, there's sort of a blanket of witness around the entire world. From all four winds, all four directions, people will be ingathered. Revelation speaks of the 144,000 at this point hiding in caves. It's talking about angels sweeping across, giving final evangelistic um, witness calls of the gospel and, and people being brought into the kingdom. There are those who will be swept into the millennial kingdom and those who will be left out. He is both terrible and wonderful at the same time. He's both judgment and rescue. How do we get our head around all of this? Well, I think it's just important to understand that we want all of who this God is. Jesus' love, Jesus' is love, but never to the expense of his justice and judgment. We want all of him. All of God's attributes are found in Christ because by nature, Jesus is all God. All of him is God. You say, well, how do we look for two things at once? Well, let me try to explain this. Who was um, down power this uh, week, right? Some of us. Come on. Who, who lost power, right? Who lost power twice? We did. But we didn't lose power for 24 hours. I found out that there were some people, my neighbors, who um, one street over were off of our grid on a different grid, and they didn't have power for or heat or, you know, electricity for 24 hours. That's a long time in cold weather, and I didn't know that, uh, but I, so the other night on, I guess it was Thursday night, I was, you know, studying, I was actually finishing my first draft of the sermon on Thursday night, that's what I do, and I, I preach it to some men, and on Friday morning, well, um, on Thursday night, I'm typing, and, and looking out my back window, and I see this um, Sprinter van, one of those big high-top vans um, that was sitting out on Merganser, just right out there, kind of in the dark, and in the dark because there's no power over there yet. And um, I was nervous about it because you could just see some people in it agitated, moving around, and lights were kind of coming on and off in the cab light inside, just spooky looking for me, okay? You're learning too much about me, but I'm like watching... What is that, you know? And they're not really parked in front of the neighbor's house. You know, they're kind of in between. So what are they up to? And I call one of my teens, my teenager's over. Let's, do we need to call a cop, you know, to just do a drive-by? Like, what, you know, what are we doing? And um, then I hear sirens in the background and they're looming and getting louder. I'm thinking, okay, something's up, you know, something's happening. And then they're more agitated and somebody's in and out. And, you know, then I sort of turned back to my notes and forgot about it and turned around and they were gone. Next morning, I'm, I'm with the men in the pre-sermon time. And one of, the, one of the guys there lives in the orange house. It's right on the corner there. And um, I said, I should have called you. I should have told you it was a creepy van outside. He said, no, that van was the power company putting our power back on. Like that was our rescue. That was everything. Like he didn't really, you know, confront me like, oh, man, you almost scared him off. No, as if I could. But it just shows the difference in perspective of how something can feel dangerous and feel terrible, but it's a matter of perspective. We want a God that is the God of justice, the God of wrath, um, who's this big, who's this awesome, who's this terrible, because he is equally that saving, that loving, that gracious, that welcoming, and that rescuing God that we love what is it going to look like in the millennial kingdom? Let me just read to you a paragraph about the millennium. That's an inspired paragraph written by Isaiah. Isaiah 11. It begins with the day of the Lord, though. They shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. This is Jesus' birth. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So all the way from the line of David to Jesus' birth. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and 
the fear of the Lord. That's his ministry. The Holy Spirit descends upon him. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor. This is his gracious ministry. Lamb of God, healing the sick, helping people, teaching, and decide equity with the meek of the earth. And he, but then he shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. This is also Jesus. And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Illusion of Revelation 19. Now here's the millennial kingdom. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little children shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, Jesus, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious.